We've been talking about relationship regulation theory as part of an ethics of social roles, understanding how the way in which we ought to behave, the things we treat as virtuous, that motivate us, that we take as legitimate reasons for acting um, and feeling certain ways about things and so on, that all of that comes from, in a sense, or depends on, at least in some respects, the social situation, and in particular, the social relationship we find ourselves. There's different kinds of social relationships. And the idea of FISC is really that they're built into the structure of the human mind. They're innate. We have certain innate categories for relationships. We're oriented toward relationships, and we think of what is excellent, we think of what is acceptable and unacceptable, in terms of those relationships. Well, last time we talked about communal sharing relationships. Today, I want to move on to the second category, an authority ranking relationship. This is something we saw in Confucius as a matter of vertical sort of relationships, where one person is higher, other, other person is lower in some kind of order. For example, within the family, parents, by virtue of age, outrank children, okay? At least up to a certain level. Eventually, maybe that reverses on the basis of some other order than age. Um, similarly, grandparents might be held to have, and in general, elders in a society might be held to have a greater position than young people. Um, and it might be different dimensions, in other words, which people vary. In military cases, it's not age, it's rank. Um, and in a business organization, it might be dependent on the position you hold. The younger person might have a much higher position than the older person, and so on. Um, so there are different dimensions of all of this. But nevertheless, the idea is some people are of higher rank, some people are of lower rank. It's a linear order. Now, sometimes, of course, we have a more complicated structure than that. Um, in most organizations, an organizational chart doesn't just look like that. It looks more like this. There might be the uh, president and then various vice presidents, and they have certain people under them, and so on and so forth. And that kind of thing is a tree structure. Now, notice each branch of the tree is still a linear order. However, it may be there are different branches that make up the organization. So sometimes we have a simple linear order. Sometimes we have a tree structure composed of a bunch of linear rulings. But in any event, a lot of organizations do have that structure. Okay? Um, the University of Texas has that structure at certain levels. In fact, the administration. <laughs> what I came here was a very simple structure. It was easy to understand. There's a the president. There are a couple of vice presidents. There are deeds. A few assistant deeds. Now it's this ornate thing that I... I I've once seen a chart of it, and it's kind of like the chart of the various agencies in the federal government. <laughs> it's like, yeah, no human being could possibly understand this chart. In any event, um, things do tend to become more complicated as a society or an organization becomes complex. Now, what I want to do is think about the nature of these sorts of authority things. So what are the characteristics of them? And then we're going to think about the values that attach to them, what kinds of reasons they give people for acting. Uh, maybe we really can't even describe the structure without understanding something of that. What kind of norms come in? What is it that shapes an authority ranking relationship? So let's, let's, before maybe we get into the way of really understanding exactly how this functions, let's think of some examples. I've already mentioned a few examples. <laughs> Families might be like this. Um, businesses, universities, the military is a great example. Where else might we find this kind of authority ranking relationship? Playgrounds. Playgrounds? Ah, okay, yeah, playgrounds. Tell me more. How does that work in a playground? Well, I think some playgrounds kind of come off as there's the, the one or two top dogs kind of choose the game, and they kick the ball, and they choose what the points are, what the rules are, and there's the similar ones kind of follow and do what those people say. Okay, good. Yeah, that often does happen, right? I, I don't 
really understand that dynamic at all. Which probably explains why I was always the last person picked for a team. <laughs> I remember like the first time, I wasn't the last person. I was the next last person. It's like, yeah, rising in the social hierarchy here. <laughs> okay, but somehow this was always established. It's like, I, I, yeah, anyway, it was a mystery to me. But you're absolutely right. Now, notice some of these things that are formally established. In the military, it's very clear to formally establish how this goes. But on the playground, it's not like, this I'm captain of the playground. You're only the lieutenant captain of the playground. It's not like that. Um, it just somehow emerges in this informal way that never once gets communicated. Other contexts that have this kind of structure, formally or informally. Yeah. Jungle. I mean, amongst animals, you have like producers, primary consumers, secondary, like like the lines at the top, and like, yeah, like, food chain, right, <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, exactly. So good. Um, in fact, when Kipling writes his books on the jungle, uh, the law of the jungle, or the jungle book, or various things like this. He's concerned to stress often the similarity between those kinds of animal relationships and human relationships. That there are these kinds of predator They're and prey. They're egalitarian, though. Like a lot of the animals in the Jungle Book, like generally you would have like a bear being friends with them. Well, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that it does a very realistic. I, you know, the bear or the elephant did not actually get its trunk by getting too curious and being lured by a crocodile, grabbed onto its nose and pulled it out like that, which is how Kipling explains how the elephant got its trunk. Um, anyway, yeah, that, you're right. It's not uh, exactly like that. But yes, a jungle has a kind of hierarchy of animals that are stronger, animals that are weaker, um, even within something like a wolf pack as well as then between species. Other places we find this kind of structure. In a kitchen, you have chefs and sous chefs and stuff like that. Oh, all right, good. In the kitchen of a restaurant, um, or wherever it's more complicated than just one person, yeah. <laughs> you tend to have somebody who is actually playing this role, somebody who's playing that role, somebody who tells other people what to do. Um, other examples. Yeah. Does this have to be officially established authority, or can it just be this person on the board has more influence than the other people, so even though they're equal, they're more powerful? Good, okay, often it is informal. That's a bit like a playground situation. So right? can we just say this is virtually everywhere? Virtually everywhere. <laughs> okay, is it virtually everywhere? Even as supposedly equal relationships or communal relationships, there's still those power dynamics. Ah, okay, yes. So maybe it's easier to think of where this doesn't obtain if there are such places. Does it happen everywhere? Uh, often, I mean, it's relatively rare that there are official structures. I mean, in this classroom among the students, you look like a group that has no official leadership, right? On the other hand, and in the first weeks, maybe there is no structure, really, that nothing like this has emerged. But by the end, often what happens in a class is there are certain people who are perceived as leaders. And a lot of what makes a class work or not work is whether such people emerge and who they are and how well they lead. Yeah. How, how would you describe a structure as like the, uh, the Supreme Court where they have like a first among equals sort of thing, but that would be horizontal, but one of them still does have a little bit more authority? Ah, something like the Supreme Court is an interesting example. Uh, one person is the chief justice, others are associate justices. So there's that kind of formal structure. But then even among the associates, um, and really among the whole group, there are informal leadership patterns that emerge. So certain people are known to be opinion leaders and shape other people's opinions and put together coalitions and so on. Um, so some people <coughs> leave Portland, say, and you don't feel much effect because, let's say, they're replaced by somebody who's ideologically similar, they make similar decisions, they don't have a significant impact. Other people were playing that kind of leadership role, and if they depart, then it makes a big difference. Because you're right, there are people who really do play an important role in influencing other people. Um, and what happens in a court decision like that is it's not just, well, I suppose that your example of a board of directors or something like that is like this too. You have to make some joint decision. And so the person who can actually influence others is someone who can play a significant leadership role, even without having any sort of title or position that goes along with that. 
In fact, if we think about those things, we think, yeah, wait, there are different kinds of leadership that are getting exerted here. And there's a negative way of putting this. You know, Marx considers this in an economic context, something like wage slavery. The capitalist controls the proletariat and you know, treats them as wage slaves. But from a more positive point of view, you can say, well, wait a minute, often this is an entirely voluntary thing, right? It's a question of leadership. And people follow leaders and grant them authority for all sorts of reasons. So one thing that is useful to do is think about what Weber says. In fact, at one point, um, Fisk alludes to Weber and talks about his, well, mentions in one sentence, his own, uh, his, Max Weber's theory of leadership. But let's talk about that for a minute. <clears throat> because there is an important dimension of leadership that has nothing to do with formal structures. In fact, on the question of authority, there are different kinds. And so <clears throat> Weber says, first of all, there are lots of kinds that are just traditional. And what are those traditional sorts of leadership? Well, he said they come in as different groups. For example, sometimes leadership is based on age, or at any rate, experience, something like that. So in the family, it tends to be the elders who are held in this position. And this can be true in entire societies. Maybe people who are older have a greater stature and are viewed as leaders. Um, there are societies that worship ancestors for similar reasons. Um, I remember calling, in the old days, saying, we have to put together a committee of graybeards, meaning you know, the older and wiser faculty. I, of course, was young at the time, and I thought, hey, older does not equal wiser. <laughs> now I'm old, I think, well, it's country does. But <laughs> in any event, uh, age is one factor here. A second is just um, that sometimes these view positions are viewed as inherited. So think about a traditional monarchy. The king or the queen inherits that position. They don't have to be older than the other people in the royal family. They just have to be in the line of inheritance. And sometimes it works that way. Why is this person in charge of the company? Well, because his father was the founder of the company. This type of thing. Okay, so sometimes leadership is just inherited. And he calls that patriarchal leadership, right, by the way, but don't think of that in terms of necessarily contemporary feminist theory patriarchy, though I suppose that would be one example of the kind of thing that is being discussed here. Um, it's much more general. It just has to do with it being passed down. Then there is what he refers to as patrimonial leadership, which is something like administrative. So think about the agents of the king. Let's say. The king has that authority by virtue of inheriting it, but then has a variety of ministers and officials who are appointed by the king. Their authority is something like this administrative authority. You might think of it as derivative in a way. On the other hand, the king might die, and the monarchy is no longer, is abandoned. But nevertheless, that bureaucracy survives. And so it is something like bureaucratic authority. Um, and then there is another kind that is traditional that he talks about, and just calls feudal. And the idea behind feudal authority is that there is some kind of agreement. There's a kind of contract. So the lord of the manor enters into a contract with the lesser <laughs> nobility and then ultimately serfs. I protect you. You work for me. Um, I allow you to live on the land. You work the land and give me a certain part of the proceeds. This type of thing. So that's based on a contract. It's traditional. On the other hand, these others are not noticed. They don't involve the agreement of both parties. This one does. Anyway, that's one kind of leadership. Or perhaps four kinds of the same general family. But a second kind he refers to as charismatic. And that's due to the personality of the leader. Somebody who is a leader and attracts followers independently of this. It's not that they're older, it's not that they've inherited this in some way. They don't have any administrative position. They haven't entered into some contract. But nevertheless, they're leaders because of personal magnetism or something like that. <clears throat> Maybe expertise, what they did to impress this people. So, what are some examples of charismatic leaders? 
Mussolini, okay, good. Mussolini marches on Rome. Now, he does this in the early 20s. Um, who's he? He was the editor of some socialist newspaper. You know, he's some nobody. He's basically this crank who wrote, wrote for the Italian equivalent of what? Avanti. The, the what? I think it was called Avanti or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to think of a contemporary equivalent. I mean, whatever it is, he, he comes and he, he suddenly marches on Rome and he declares himself leader. And people believe him, right? And he's very charismatic. He gives these speeches, always with the same sort of stance. He was a short man, but nevertheless, it's this imposing presence. Always looks up, always the chin forward, always the chest out, usually in a military uniform. Oh, this haughty expression on his face. Um, and he speaks to thousands, they follow him, okay? Purely charisma. Now, there have been other charismatic leaders like that throughout history. Um, sometimes in bad causes. Hitler and other <coughs> I mean, who's he? Um, but he starts giving these speeches. And my grandfather used to listen to them even though he didn't speak German. Just because he said, they're still remarkable. The charisma comes through even though you don't know what he's saying. <laughs> um, my grandfather was not a Nazi, but he was, he was a Pittsburgh railway worker who had the shortwave radio and could listen to all sorts of broadcasts from all over the world. And he started hearing these crowds screaming in the you know, mid-30s. He was like, what's this? <laughs> in any event, um, he was so charismatic, you didn't actually have to understand what he was saying. You were going to think, good grief, this is something remarkable. But in a lot of cases, charismatic leaders do things in a positive way, right? They can use their leadership qualities in good ways or in bad ways. So there's nothing necessarily wrong with this. And in fact, a lot of it has to do with the kind of thing that happens on the playground. You know, why does that kid get to be the leader of the playground? Well, maybe it's because he's older. Maybe it's because his big brother is the leader. <laughs> he's not taken over since big brother went on to high school. Maybe. It's a question of, well, you know, the real power behind the throne has said, this kid's the boss, okay? Uh, my brother was once called to the principal's office in high school, and the principal said, listen, I can never catch you doing anything, and you, you never personally seem to be involved. But everything bad that happens at this school involves people you're close friends with. <laughs> okay, and somehow you're on the edge of everything bad that happens. You're like the godfather of this high school. <laughs> of course, my brother still tells us he's very proud of this. <laughs> uh, but in any case, yeah, the authority of the other people is sort of patrimonial. Okay, but like, yeah, Jim, Jim said, you know, blah blah blah. Uh, but anyway, um, it's usually on the playground, not anything like that. It's just through charisma. So. That kid says something, people follow. What other kinds of leadership are there? Are there other kinds? Violent? Well, ah, sometimes there is authority just imposed by violence. And in fact, that's a separate category. Weber says, here I'm thinking of people who willingly follow. But you're absolutely right, there is just coercion. And so sometimes the leader is the one who has the gun. Okay. Um, uh, and that's, that's not the kind of, Baker says basically, yeah, that's a different thing. I mean, if, if somebody puts a gun to my set, head and says, you know, open the safe, and I'm, well, I mean, I'm a philosopher, I would think, what's safe? What are you talking about? Why is it safe anyway? You can find safe, <laughs> no, but I mean, <laughs> suppose I'm working in a bank. Somebody says, open the safe, and they have a gun. Um, I am not. It's not that they've somehow gotten that position through inheritance. It's not because of their charisma. It's because of their gun. And so you're right. This is sort of as opposed to coercion, which is its own category, and which is does give people a kind of authority, but not a question of willing, willingly accepted by those at the bottom. Um, so there is that kind of phenomenon, which is in a lot of ways like that. That is a temporary this kind of authority. Yeah. Is like someone having a skill or like certain knowledge like charismatic or is like... Okay, good. Yes, often people develop this sort of charisma, not by, by personality, just because they're really good. Um, they're colleagues in the philosophy department that people listen to and take very seriously. And it's not because they're personally <coughs> magnetic. In fact, one person I'm thinking of is 
kind of the opposite of that. <laughs> uh, when he first arrived here, actually, the students didn't like his classes because he looked at the floor, he looked at the ceiling, he kind of mumbled um, in a strong foreign accent, and people were like, what's this? Uh, he's learning to adapt. <laughs> but he has the power he does because he's a very famous person and is brilliant and knows a lot. And so it's purely talent that really leads to that sort of charisma. And often in the arts, it's a similar thing. That artist isn't highly regarded because they are personally so dynamic. It's just because their art amazes people. Um, and they don't need a personal charisma. Um, you can maybe think of some pop stars who are highly personally charismatic, and it's partly the person is the brand, more than the music, let's say. But there are other people, it's the music. And it's not that they're personally that amazing. Um, so I won't ask you to name your favorite examples of these. I can think of a few. Like, yeah, that person's amazing, but it's because of what they do. It's not because, you know, look at them and you think, whoa. Um, OK, well, there is a third kind, which he thinks is becoming more and more significant. And that is a legal or rational authority. That is to say that increasingly, we put in positions of leadership in society um, and create categories of authority for legal and rational reasons. It's not a question of tradition. It's not a question of the charisma of a particular leader. Increasingly, he says, in democratic societies, in republics, in, in societies that are governed more or less with the input of the participants, <laughs> um, they agree upon the rules. It's a little bit like a feudal authority in that there's a contract. But it's not a contract with a particular person. It's a contract with a certain kind of structure. It's not that I make some agreement with the particular president of UT to teach here. And if there's a new president, then oh, well, I better make a new contract. <laughs> right? My contract is established as a part of an institutional structure that's independent of any of the people involved. And most big organizations are really like that. So Weber sees society is progressing roughly from these conceptions of leadership towards something like this. But anyway, his point is, and Fisk's point is, all societies have actually all of these <laughs> kinds at certain stages, and moreover, have these four models operating. And so there aren't going to be any societies you find that just never have any authority in relationships. Well, we were challenged to think, does this then happen everywhere? I mean, once we get to the charismatic and the legal and so on, are there any relationships where there is no authority ranking of this kind? Yeah? I don't think so. I mean, even in a conversation where we consider both participants equal interlocutors in dialogue, we have one person who's setting the tone of dialogue, and you have one person whose inputs and interjections are taken more seriously. Um, and when two people disagree on this, you have what's perceived as social awkwardness. Right. Um, but yeah, I don't see a space where you can say, like, these two are just actually equal. Any of you who comes in is equal as well. Great. Okay, good. I think this relates to a point that this stresses later, which is that in all real relationships, different models are operating. Okay? It's not as if, hey, my relationship with my wife is completely a communal sharing relationship. And my relationship with my colleague is completely an equality matching relationship. And my relationship with my students is entirely an authority, you know. It certainly it's not with my cats, gosh, it feels like a complex <laughs> negotiation, and it's not a question of uh, that sort of thing at all. Um, and so basically you have to think, wait, any real relationship is a mix of all of these. And a lot of these times things form temporarily. So suppose you are within a marriage or some other romantic relationship, and you feel like, like it's basically a communal sharing. There is no his, there is no hers, there's no my, there's no yours, it's just ours. And, but you're right, wait, within this conversation, one person might know more than the other person. So they become something like the authority temporarily. Now that doesn't make the whole thing an authority ranking relationship. These are not meant to be moment by moment things. Weber's talking about these as being permanent things. But he does point out that there are lots of temporary relationships like this that form and then go away, depending on who knows more about that topic. A friend with whom you have primarily an equality relationship has been to a new restaurant you haven't. You say, oh, tell me about it. Well, 
gosh, suddenly that person has an authority that you don't, right? You're listening. And if, you, if they start telling you, oh, they have these zucchini noodles and they're really good, and you start saying, no, they don't. They don't have zucchini noodles. <laughs> He's going, well, I've been there. I ate them. What are you talking about? Right? It would be a weird thing for you to challenge that. You don't get an equal say on that. That person actually knows what they're talking about. You don't. Um, now, maybe it's different. Maybe you've read a review and blah, blah, blah. So maybe you actually do have some other source of knowledge. But you're right, often this happens. And in a conversation, it can happen very quickly. Ah, oh, this is a topic you know about, tell me. So suddenly you become like the authority. And then I know about this topic, so it changes. And that kind of thing can happen very quickly all the time. And similarly, within a group, some people may have uh, an ability to lead the group in this sense, but not in that sense, or on this topic and not on that. Or you know, for the moment, this person seems to be leading it, and then somebody else is. But no, look, I think all this is confused, blah, blah, blah. But then they lead things in a different direction. So a lot of the things that look like this form very temporarily in relationships of any kind. Well, let's think about some of the things that are norms that go along with this. So tell me what kinds of norms govern authority ranking relationships. Notice there are norms. It's not like, I am the boss, you are the follower. You must do as I say. Uh, that is it. I mean, notice there, there is a norm. You must go there. But <laughs> I, I don't know why I do these accents. <laughs> Plays up roles. Um, I used to, when I was angry at my dog, I used to speak to her in German. I found. And when I was very happy, I would speak in Dutch or Serbo Croatian. And I find that with my cats, I almost always speak to them in a Pittsburgh accent. I act as the fellow Pittsburghers. And, <laughs> and so, I, anyway, I don't know why I do this. Um, but anyway, so what, yeah, what norms govern these kinds of relationships? Yeah. Eye contact can be very important. In a dominance relationship, it's often frowned upon to look the king or uh, the leader directly in the eye. But in cases where when you're trying to give somebody respect, it's actually good to look somebody in the eye the entire time to show that you value their input. Okay, good, good. Now, if we think about these norms, we think, well, wait, um, unlike a communal sharing relationship where everybody's in it together, or next time we'll talk about a quality matching relationship where the whole idea is equality, and so it's, there's going to be a symmetry in such a way that the norms applying to you and the norms applying to me are the same. In this kind of relationship, that's not true. Right? We have to think about it both, in both directions. There are going to be the norms that are, as it were, the, um, what? <laughs> The upward looking norms, the norms that apply to those who are lower down in the hierarchy. So lower toward higher. And then there will also be norms that go the other direction. The norms governing the people at the top and the obligations they have to people below them. And so we really need two sets here when we think about this relationship. That won't be that wasn't true last time, it won't be true next time. But here it really matters what the direction is. So now let's think about this eye talk contact question. You appear before the king. How do you behave? Yeah. Deference. With deference, exactly right. Now, in a particular cultural setting, deference might mean you must make eye contact. It might mean you better not make eye contact. <laughs> okay? And that all is culturally determined and may vary from setting to setting. Maybe on the playground, it's very dangerous to make eye contact. But maybe in another setting, you're supposed to pay close attention. Um, in any event, yeah, in this upward direction, we have a norm of deference. And that indeed might involve behaviors that are meant to show respect. Okay, so perhaps you bow before the king. Um, or maybe you address the king as your excellency um, or your majesty or something like that. Now, most of us do not exist within monarchies. So this may seem of limited usefulness in thinking about organizational ethics. But still, um, you, your boss calls you in for a meeting. Okay? You walk in, and is there a kind of deference that you are to show? What form would that take in most organizations? You don't bow, right? You don't walk in. <laughs> but what do you do? <laughs> yeah. Give a handshake, yes, say yes, sir, to everything. Um, ah, okay, good. Handshake. Um, yes, sir. No, ma'am. This type of thing. Um, 
at least in a lot of contexts, and certainly here in the South, um, there are parts of the country where that's actually considered some kind of weird insult. I don't understand that myself, but I've heard of that being, I mean, one kid, you know, was at a Virginia school, got suspended because he said yes ma'am to the teacher. <laughs> when I was, I was in school in Virginia for a while, and you had better say yes ma'am. I, I, I moved there from Pittsburgh, I didn't know it was what. The teacher asked a question, I said, yeah. What? <laughs> like, that did not show proper efforts. I said, yes, ma'am. You know, at first I was, yes. Yes, what? <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> I didn't get it. Uh, but anyway, yeah, there, there is, in short, speech, forms of speech. You don't walk into the boss's office, put your feet up on the desk and say, so how's it going, dude? <laughs> right? Unless you know your boss really, really well. Um, other forms in which this deference oh, might be Yeah. Um, coming prepared and respecting their time. Ah, good. So yes, it might be a question of preparation. Um, respect for time. The timetable is something that's really set by the boss. You don't come in and say, well, you know, listen, I need, we're, we're going to have to discuss this for at least half an hour. Um, the boss will tell you what there's worth doing, right? You don't set the agenda. Uh, and you don't establish the time. So the agenda, what you talk about in that meeting is, now the boss may be open to suggestions. Bosses may delegate authority. Bosses may say, hey, listen, I want to know what's on your mind, and so forth. Um, but nevertheless, that person is really giving you the space to control certain things if you have that ability at all. Um, anything else that is part of that pattern of difference? Well, there's more to it than just showing deference, right? So what other obligations do followers have toward leaders? Do employees have to bosses? Um, sergeants have to captains? Things like this. Yeah, like acceptance, you have to agree with what they decide in kind of situation. Ah, good. So accepting decisions. You don't work against the decision once it's made. Now, a lot of leaders actually want input from subordinates. We'll say, tell me what you think. They will allow for, in fact, encourage an argument, presentation of different points of view. But once the decision is made, you've got to implement the decision. You can't think, well, I think I disagree with that decision, so I'm not going to do it. Um, you are you're obliged to go along with and accept the decision. Um, and what else then follows from that? Yeah. Similarly related as being loyal to the leader himself or herself. Okay, good. So loyalty is a very important thing. Loyalty, allegiance. Yes? I don't know what the word for this is, but like in businesses, like you have like the obligation to like make a profit and like do that for your boss. I don't know if there's a word for that there. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, there are lots of words that might express that idea specifically. Um, part of that you might say is, look, you're supposed to do what the boss wants, obedience. But you also might say, look, um, it's not just obeying. It's a question of actually carrying out this, right? Actually directing efforts, working toward the boss's goal. So that might be maximizing shareholder value and return on investment. It might be producing a complicated report on something. It might be providing information. Um, but yes, it's a question of, um, you might say, just working to achieve the organization's goal. And that's something that is generally established by the person who is superior. So if we think about all human action as a question of certain means that are selected to attain certain ends, well then, you might say, Part of this deference is question of the person in a superior position establishes the ends, right? And then your job often is to come up with means that are effective at attaining those ends. The boss doesn't say, well, do whatever you want. Seek any goal you like within the organization. The boss says, here's our goal. 
and then may give you detailed directions that you're supposed to obey for how to do it. Um, the chef may say, no, 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 chop the onion small, right? And that's specific. But it may just be, in general, like, yeah, we'll need onions for this dish. And then it's up to you to craft the proper means that will serve the general end of that, creating a successful dish. So in short, often you might have the choice of means. And so it's not just a question of obeying directives. It's a question of actually, in a lot of cases, making your own choices that serve the end that's established, whatever that happens to be. What else are the obligations of people toward their superiors? Yeah. Um, not in a way they owe certain things to their coworkers, and they owe it to their superior to respect their coworkers in a way. They, they can't just show deference to their superior, um, they also have to show a certain level of deference to their coworkers. Ah, oh, that's very interesting. Okay. Yeah, if we think about these sorts of relationships, Thinking of them in these simple linear terms can be a little bit misleading because strictly speaking, what we have in this kind of ordering is something that assigns you a rank, right? And so it's not as if we get one person, one person, one person, one person. Think about a military structure, and that really is a line. It's not really this kind of branching thing. It goes like this. So you have, um, let's say, the general, the colonel, um, the major, the captain, the lieutenant, the sergeant, and so on down the line. But it's not just the, right? There is more than one general. In fact, I, I just read that in Venezuela there are now 4,000 generals. <laughs> like, what do they do? <laughs> I mean, 4,000? That's a lot of cooks giving commands in the kitchen. But anyway, um, you've got multiple people. And so, what is your obligation? It's not just, you might say, to the person who's the superior person, but also that, in some kind of derivative way, maybe, gives you obligations to the other people who are in that hierarchy. So, you are not just obliged to follow the command of the major and the colonel and the general, you also actually now owe something to the people alongside you who are also, let's say, um, captains within that structure. And that is, in part, moving us toward this equality matching idea. But it's the same kind of thing you can observe in a family. To some extent, you have an obligation to brothers and sisters independently of any obligation you have to your parents. On the other hand, suppose you're constantly picking on your siblings. You're constantly causing trouble. Your parents may take that as an affront to their authority. Because part of the goal is, look, this organization has to function well. And if you're screwing up the function, even if you're not attacking me, you're still messing up, right? <laughs> and so you might say, look, there are then, I don't know what to call these. Fisk doesn't really talk about this, but, but it's a kind of, let me just call it a subsidiary. Um, obligation. A subsidiary duty that means it flows from that. Out of respect for your parents, you treat your brothers and sisters in a certain way. Out of respect for the general, you treat your fellow captains in a certain way. And yes, there will be then some independent way of thinking about that relationship that we'll discuss next time. But some of this is just going to fall, follow from the structure and the sense that, look, this structure has a goal, and I better, in order to obey the goal of the organization, I better treat the people at my level of certain way. Yeah? I mean, that has to do with like knowing where you belong, like your place. Ah, good, okay, yes. There is something about this in general that is crucial to people's identities, okay? Um, and that is a dimension of this <laughs> that a lot of philosophers don't think much about, but that Fisk stresses. Yes, often in such a structure, it is important to know your place. And that, we think of that phrase in a kind of negative way, know your place, right? But actually, it's pretty important to people's identity. Um, it's important to my identity, for example, that I'm a professor. Um, most professors, if you say, oh, you're an educator, will feel vaguely insulted. <laughs> and it's not because we hate students. It's because that makes us sound like one of those guys, okay? That's not our place. 
Okay, those are the people who make big decisions and produce long reports that nobody reads, and have only a negative effect on what we actually do down here. Uh, <laughs> okay, and so it's like, wait, you, you think I'm some kind of dean or something? Oh, that's an insult. Okay. <laughs> Now, in most of these feudal structures, that isn't viewed as an insult. And in fact, part of the reason Rousseau is highly suspicious of these kinds of relationships is he thinks, look, this gives me an incentive to actually be a hypocrite. Now, what, what does he mean? People become inauthentic because you want to pretend a higher rank. So there is a sense of identity, but also it's not possible to try to fake an identity. You can try to pretend to be something you're not. Um, and so there are people who will, God, what are ways in which you try to appear to be higher status than you really are? Yeah, wear designer labels, dress differently, right? dress for success. Um, what else? Fix your posture and your tone of voice. Good, posture, tone of voice. You don't speak in the Pittsburgh accent the way you would speak to your cats. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, and for a lot of us who were not brought up speaking exactly standard English, there's that kind of adjustment to the way you speak. Um, there are other things like this that involve trying to adopt a certain pattern of behavior. And so there is at least the possibility of that kind of thing opening up here. Yeah, I think everyone goes through this at some point, and most people get out of it, but some people don't, and that's just using big words all the time in ways that often don't make sense because you don't completely understand it? Yes, good, good, good. Part of the reason that sophomores got that name, what does it mean, sophomore? It comes from Greek, it means wise fool. Okay. <laughs> and this is characteristic sophomore behavior. Okay. In fact, we have the adjective sophomoric to go with it, <laughs> which means it sounds smart, but it's really stupid. And that's what often happens to people. They come to college, they learn a bunch of big new words. And when they're freshmen, they're excited about it, right? They don't really put it on air. But by the time they're sophomores, they think, I'm supposed to sound intelligent. So they write these papers full of big words they don't understand. And if somebody actually knows what they mean, they realize, yeah, this is all complete nonsense. Um, it's a horrible feeling. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's that's right. I mean, some people never get caught out. I mean, so there are French bad. philosophers who are still doing it, as far as I can tell. But as it happens, you know, yeah, you can get into this thing of trying to sound sophisticated. And later, you get to the point of realizing, wait, if I really understand this, I can say it clearly. I don't have to use big words. Um, so that kind of, and, and that happens a lot, by the way, in business. It's not just in academia. Um, I have read business reports and business plans and things like that that are just astounding, incomprehensible. Um, a friend and I established a business where we were basically trying to help people communicate with ad agencies. And we reviewed thousands of advertising briefs, things companies prepare for their ad agency to say, here's what we want in this campaign. <laughs> the, the longest were over 100 pages long, filled with jargon that was basically unintelligible. The shortest was five words, what we said at lunch. <laughs> but there was no uniformity in this, or I mean, some of it was just a bunch of wordy nonsense. Okay, well, we've been talking about norms to go in this direction. What about norms in the other direction? You were the boss. What do you owe your subordinates? Yeah, competence. Ah, okay, good. <laughs> competence. Yeah, one of the most frustrating things, being an employee and trying to do all of this, is working for somebody who's incompetent and keeps selecting the wrong end, and keeps telling you to do the wrong kind of thing, and then makes stupid judgments about what their subordinates do. Um, that can be an immensely frustrating thing. What other obligations flow from the top down? Uh, to be decisive. Go okay, hang good. You've got to actually make decisions. A good leader leads, right? They actually produce decisions. It's great to ask for input, but on the other hand, in the end, if you just say, well, okay, you know, hmm, I don't know, um, that, that leaves the subordinates in a position of not knowing what happens. Um, they're then without any direction. That's not going to work for any sort of organizational goal either. What else? Uh, leading in a way that like, benefits everybody. Okay, good. Benefit. 
Um, think about parents. They're supposed to be making decisions that benefit their children, right? And so there is a question of benefit, of care, of, um, gosh, <laughs> not here care just in the sense of concern, but actually being helpful to subordinates, helping to prepare them, develop them. Uh, and so it's, you might say, development or nurturing. What else? Explanations. Giving explanations. Okay, good. Um, why is it important that a leader be able to explain a decision? Yeah. Because because you sometimes you just get mad at the decision, so if they just explain it to you, you kind of like, all right, I see where you're coming from. Okay, good, good. After all, you're supposed to be working toward this end, right? Now, suppose you think it's a, an insane decision to do it at all. First of all, you're not going to be very motivated to do it. <laughs> Secondly, you won't understand how to actually implement these means to attain that end. Because you won't know what you're, why that makes any sense, right? Um, I used to work with somebody who actually had a very nice analogy. The boss is supposed to see how the various puzzle pieces all fit together. You are often in a position to see one particular part of the puzzle. And you may not understand why you have to put that piece there. You might think, oh, this doesn't work, I don't, this doesn't fit. But it's because you don't see the big picture of what it is all about. And so explanations help, not only help to motivate you, but help you be more effective. It's hard to be effective if you don't understand what the goal is or why somebody would choose to do that. Yeah. I was just thinking like, Karate Kid, you know, it does max all, max off, and you know, if you don't, like, why am I doing this? And then it comes up later, oh, ah, max all. Yeah. Right, okay, good, oh. yes. Exactly. So sometimes it's like, I'll explain it to you when you're older. <laughs> sometimes you've got to do that, but you're right. I mean, until that it seems pointless, right? It, he doesn't get the point of the wax on and wax off until suddenly you realize, oh, okay, it actually receives what it's for. <laughs> Other obligations the people at the top have. Yeah. Um, like consideration, like when an employee is pregnant, then there's laws regarding that. Okay, good. There are all sorts of laws about that, and it has to do in part with cares and care and so on. But it's partly out of consideration, partly a question of respect. This is why most people think of a Marxist sort of wage slavery analogy as really misleading. If you really are treated like a slave within that organization, that's a sign that the people at the top aren't doing it. That's that's a defect. That's not successful management, that's that's not showing those basic obligations. Yeah? Um, I guess um, leaders generally just have more responsibility. Because, I mean, if you're taking yourself off a cliff, and I mean, that's terrible, but if you're taking yourself and a bunch of other people off a cliff, that's just exponentially worse. Good, 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 good. So, yes, responsibility and taking responsibility, right? Accountability. There's nothing more frustrating than a boss who makes the decision, and then when everything goes wrong, blames the people who are subordinates. It's like, yeah, no, it was a bad decision. It's not that they did it wrong. You did it wrong. <laughs> okay, and a good leader takes responsibility and says, look, um, I take full responsibility for this. Doesn't constantly pass the buck off to people lower in the chain. Yeah? They need a spine, so they can't just be blown with the wind by what? One underling says, and then another underling says something else. And... Oh, good. Good. So, yes, they need a sense of constancy. And notice that's important, not only in general, to try to promote the achievement of the organization's ends, but also really to respect the people below. If the boss is constantly changing his or her mind about everything, what do you do? Right? It's like, well, what's the rule for dealing with this problem today? <laughs> but that's incredibly frustrating. So you need someone who actually makes a decision and sticks with it so that you actually can work with it. 